Yeah? Great. Thank you. Um, yes, Christine Borland. I'm an artist and Baltic professor at Northumbria University. Um, thank you for the invite. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, and thank you, Mary, for, for showing uh, one project. I'd like to, to do that my, myself. Um, anatomy collections in general have been fundamentally important to my, my practice and my research throughout the last um, 20 years. And I think I can trace that back to a moment when I was a student at Glasgow School of Art in the 80s, late 80s. Then it was a rather old-fashioned course emphasising constantly the importance of, of the figure through um, life drawing, mandatory life drawing, which I, I hated and was terrible at. Um, it wasn't until my first visit to Glasgow's um, Hunterian University's collection of anatomy um, in the Anatomy Museum that... Um, I began to, to figure out my own relationship to the subject of the body and that I, I did have a great excitement when I encountered the disembodied um, body, literally preserved in spirit. Um, and I found a way to start considering that subject for myself, initially by asking the question, you know, who are they? Um, that was really the, the first thought that excited me and, and started me on a journey that still continues. So since that, that point, um, all those years ago, many, many projects have referenced this and other anatomical collections, though none of them have been invited interventions in the way that um, we've been discussing today. Um, I think it has always been that I've approached... Um, collections, museums, medical professionals, anatomists, people who work in institutions um, with a question and um, things, a relationship has developed from there, but the work has nearly always been exhibited either in a public space or in an exhibition or a museum. Um, they are, of course, the projects themselves are very reliant on at least one person from within the, the institution um, supporting me and helping me. Yes, so today I, I wanted to focus on one project which is, is very long-winded and has evolved over the last um, four years. It's a collaborative project and I have been doing it in tandem with, with other works, but it's just not possible to kind of touch upon it. Um, if I wanted to talk about it at all, I'd have to dedicate the, the half hour to it. So it's the thing that I'm, I'm most excited about at the moment. And so I hope, um, I hope that's okay with you to, to, um, to talk to you about that. I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts and, and questions about that. It is always strange um, talking about a collaboration um, on your own. Scientists and other, other kinds of researchers do it all the time, but I have to say that Brody Condon, my collaborator there, an artist from the US who's now based in Berlin, um, we developed the presentation together and um, I would certainly trust him to do the same. So... Um, we started working together around four years ago. Um, I approached him on the back of applying and um, successfully receiving a wonderful open-ended grant from Creative Scotland, Scottish sort of funding body. Um, the, it was a fund of a million pounds that was split over 20 artist projects over two years. Um, a bit of a one-off, as <laughs> not likely to, to happen again. Um, the remit was incredibly open-ended to enable, enable sorry, new collaborations which encourage experimentation, radical new work and innovative approaches to engaging with audiences. So um, I thought I'd first of all just show a little you cl YouTube clip um, of Brody's work um, so that he's got at least a, a little voice um, to describe to you um, the project he was doing at the very beginning of our dialogue of beginning to work together, which is very much based in um, performance. Um, he was working in large-scale participatory performances called LARP, I know in Scandinavia you, you know a lot more about LARP than we do in the UK. Um, 
his work. This is a detail from a, a work that I'm going to show you in a video. Um, it was focused on critically exploring self-actualization seminars from the 70s in the States. I think they're the most well-known ones, EST, Erhard Seminar Training, um, is, are, are still running today. So I'll just play a little YouTube clip of Brody. Oh, no sound. I worked a minute ago. Help. <laughs> Maybe I haven't. Let's try it again. There's nothing behind me and nothing ties me to So it starts with the self-actualization seminars from the 1970s. It's a kind of critical examination you know, into that history and its relevance to contemporary cultures. Hundreds of people came for weekend sessions to be taught how to be themselves. All right, push! Move! Do it! The S sessions were intense and often brutal. The participants signed contracts agreeing not to leave and to allow the trainers to do anything they thought necessary to break down their socially constructed identities. And from this nothing, people were able to invent a life, allowing them to create themselves. S people came out of those trainings feeling that it wasn't selfish to think about yourself. It was your highest duty. It starts with a lecture on a particular idea, driving a particular new idea into your head. Then there may be... Okay, so Brody loves all those layers of identity, which, um, which I do too. Um, when we started um, sort of working together, the proposal was around looking at the kind of performativity that um, Brody was involved with, um, the, that kind of theatre, and trying to sort of bring that into the world where I had spent a lot of time researching in the, the anatomy lab and theatre um, and the adjacent sort of anatomy collection um, in Glasgow. And um, Dr. Quentin Fogg, who's pictured there um, in the white coat, he was one of the collaborative partners mentioned on the, the grant application. So um, he was sort of um, fully signed up um, to be a partner in this um, in this process. So, as I say, it was completely open-ended. Brody and I were going to be spending some time in the anatomy lab. We were going to film. We were going to research the potential um, possibilities um, for the kinds of role-playing performances that Brody had been developing through LARPs, um, with a potential sort of educational context. Um, that's what very much what. Quentin was um, interested in thinking about how the use of these techniques in LARP could possibly potentially apply to the, the, the kind of medical education um, sort of context. He was concerned a lot about um, the way simulation is beginning to be dominating um, within the medical education arena and felt that this was a, a way to, to try to break away from that, but in a kind of safe situation. So we spent a lot of the first period of the, the grant on sort of research visits and talking to people and spending time in, in the anatomy lab. And although I had spent quite a long time in you know, sort of different visits there for various projects over the years, um, the tables were turned slightly um, because of the collaborative nature of the project. I hadn't worked that closely um, in a collaboration before, but usually I'm there sort of trying at least to appear very much in charge and be asking a lot of people how they're feeling and what they're thinking. And, you know, suddenly Brody was sort of asking me those kind of questions. And, and it was a, a very sort of different way of, of engaging with the context. And I felt much, much more vulnerable than I had done so sort of previously. Um, so one of the things that we did quite early on was based on the initial ideas um, of making a very small um, LARP um, live action role play with a number of um, more senior um, anatomy students. Um, 
Quentin himself said that he would take him out himself out the picture and let us um, sort of develop it um, for ourselves. We were allowed, it was just a research project, there was no filming or photographing involved, but we built in a role for a recorder who was um, doing drawings um, as part of the the role play. Um, so she recorded everything um, and we were allowed to actually sort of use the, the cadaveric bodies in the lab and dissection was a part of the, the role playing scenario. Um, we actually had a, a Nordic LARPer from fin Finland um, to come and create the kind of um, unscripted performative situation. Um, Another interesting thing about the, the drawing was that um, it was a, absolutely appropriate for this situation, but the, we wanted to make a little promo of the, the video work research, really only research that we had shot um, in the preceding sort of visits um, with a little bit of a voiceover about where potentially we might go. But that um, the Scottish system is based on an anatomy inspector, so all permissions had to go back to this. You know, I imagine him with a top hat on, and um, but um, he doesn't have that. But he has the final say, and he wouldn't let us use. Although all all that was happening was us documenting what happens in anatomy, um, we weren't allowed to release any video footage. But what it did do was um, because it's one person, um, it was all through Quentin the anatomist. But a, a dialogue about what we were doing or what we wanted to do did start with this um, regulator, and that came to be quite important later. So we got a little bit sidetracked and the sidetrack turned into the major part of the project. We didn't do any more LARP work. Um, what we started to get, because of that experience working in the lab, um, doing the LARP and actually working with donor bodies, um, we began to get anxious or interested or intrigued by the fact that you know these were um, participants in our project the the donors were participating in our research project um, but the, we, we didn't have the we didn't have their absolute permission um, to, to do that so we started thinking of this as a as a possibility um, of course we were assured by Quentin who said he'd actually met a couple of the, the donors that were um, involved in the project. He'd actually met them while they were still alive and he assured us that they would be up for it and um, he told us that they had ticked all the boxes um, on the anatomy bequest paperwork that basically they consented to anything and everything happening to their bodies after death. So that started us looking at the paperwork and the procedure and started starting to speculate about the idea of, um, of inserting another question into the anatomy paperwork. So um, we, we, we actually thought that we could try to do this and we applied for money for a very small sort of sub-grant because we'd need to contract a lot of um, members of staff who were sort of trained in um, sort of the kind of research where you would meet people and ask questions and um, do it all properly. So we didn't we didn't get that. So we we didn't we didn't actually do this. But it remained the thing that um, sort of excited us. The the potential of it excited us. Um, and then, in that kind of be careful what you wish for moment. Um, I was talking about the project and the research at a small um, public event, and two completely unrelated ladies came up to me at the end of it and said that they were already signed up to be anatomical body donors and if I ever wanted to make the project a reality they would love to sort of participate with me on it. So that was rather mind-blowing but of course I couldn't resist that as a, as a, as a reality to, be, to begin to try to sort of take that on. 
um, one of their stories, um, well, it wasn't really a story, she just, I, I said, well, wh why? Why on earth do you want to do it? And she said, well, when I signed up for this when I was younger, I was so excited about the possibilities of what science might do, um, could do, and, you know, I wanted to be part of that. And now I'm feeling disillusioned with, with science and... I don't think much of the possibilities, but I do think um, art has unlimited possibilities. So if I could be doing both, then that would be absolutely amazing. And the other one just had a very much... They weren't... I thought they weren't crazy. That was one thing that I wanted to ascertain. The other one, both of them just had an attitude of, we never want the party to end. If there's any way that we can still stay involved, then we're going to do it. So... Um, Brody and I sort of talked about this and we talked to Quentin um, in Glasgow and he said, yep, let's, let's take it on, um, let's include that and it's fine, your project's taking a different direction, it's wholly appropriate for, you know, for us to support this um, in the anatomy department in Glasgow and it is a, it is a research project so we'll, we'll just go with it um, and we were going very, very slowly and so things did feel participatory, we were all moving along together. But this was the start of a two-year journey um, with the donors, a series of, of meetings in their home town and ours, trips, going to see other, going to see our exhibitions, going to the Botanic Gardens, um, trying to figure out how we could possibly move forward with this. We thought it was important in the beginning not to get bogged down in any kind of legal ease and to skirt our way through and round the ethics in the most light touch way that we could and not let that dominate the project before the kind of creative element of it had been explored. Um, Later on, we introduced a few more kind of structured um, ways of trying to move forward with the research. And this is, this is one of them. Uh, it's based very much around Brodie's interest in these experimental psychotherapeutic um, sessions using some of the principles of gestalt therapy, but very much focused on objects. Um, trying to move away from an individual kind of analysis by focusing on a, an object. We're trying really hard to create a little intimate scenario in this um, medical classroom here, but um, not doing too well. We decided to focus the session. Um, again, this is very much led by Brody because it's part of the work that he does. He uses it for his ongoing work. Um, so we borrowed a, a series of objects from the Hunterian collection to use as this focus um, for the objects in the session. So we tried to choose um, objects that, you know, were full of ambiguity. You couldn't necessarily tell which body part they were. A mixture of models, um, plastinated specimens, um, and historical specimens in jars. At least one of these is a, is a uterus. You couldn't actually tell what they were um, unless you, you had a, the medical knowledge. Um, there's, the, there's the objects being photographed by the donor. So we decided at the start to um, that they were okay with being identified as female, but we would keep the kind of anonymity protocols um, as reflected um, in, the, in the kind of anatomy bequest procedures. Um, just go back there to the, the Hunterian Museum. It's wonderfully unmodernised as such. Um, so it's upstairs. Um, my very first slide, I was upstairs in the historical collection. Downstairs there are some... is is some historical material, but it's mostly mixed with plastinated specimens and models that are in a kind of happy disarray because they're taken out um, all the time for um, study um, from the students. So it, it doesn't have that thing that the John Hunter Mu Museum does in London where it, it is incredibly glass and shiny and it's very warm and wood and students uh, use it all the time and it is open to the public. So these, this aesthetically based <laughs> technique, um, these, these sessions um, that brody has been working with, um, they're based on generating descriptions of physical sensations, emotions, 
environment and they embody the, the performativity of, of Gestalt. They attempt to use present-based language. Um, so the aim is to encourage the building of a new language to imaginatively articulate objects related to the body. And we felt that that would help us in understanding sharing an understanding about body donation for this kind of artistic and aesthetic sort of purpose. Um, oh, I think I will play you just for, so you understand it a little bit more, a little snippet um, of me um, sort of participating in this. It's absolutely horribly embarrassing, but um, I, think, I think I'm going to do it. Um, it only lasts a minute or two, but it, it really is horrible. What does that say? <laughs> maybe smell it again and describe what that experience of smelling is in the present, you know? Oh, like, what is that? What's happening? Anything? Yes, I can feel in my, in my nose some, some different um, sensations than when I'm not holding holding this object up close, but um, the, the words that are, that are coming to mind are to do with the, the, the memories and not to do with the, you know, the, the present. So you asked me to try to describe the feeling of the memory coming, not necessarily what it, what it is. Describing the fact that a memory is coming up and what that feels like instead of the memory itself, instead of the story or the anecdote, but more along the lines of how you experience those memories. So thankfully we didn't really move forward with using the content of these, um, these sessions. I think they were, they were a sort of another useful tool in sort of getting to know the, the, the people um, and, and for us to be sort of making ourselves open um, as part of the as part of the process. So all the stuff was taped, but it, it hasn't, um, thank God, turned into anything yet. As part of that particular visit, we um, took them into the um, anatomy lab and um, Quentin talked them through the, the actual process of, of embalming. And they, they got to meet a donor, which... Of course, it's not usual. I think if if you sign up regularly and you wanted to do this, I'm sure it would be it would be enabled. But um, it's not something that people sort of normally, it's a rather sort of privileged and amazing sort of thing to to get to do. Um, but of course, we checked with them first that they actually wanted to do it. So he he just answered all their questions and talked them through. Um, from start to finish the whole process of what would happen to them um, um, if they ended up being, um, being donors. So uh, something comple completely different, of course, we, were we had to be on a kind of parallel trajectory of thinking that's the body of research, that's the content, but by that time we had committed to making an exhibition at CCA towards the end of the um, period of, of funding of the project. And so we were thinking that um, what we would do is develop with the donors a proposal for what we would do with their bodies um, were they to sign up um, for this artistic research as well as scientific research. So we decided to make the, the exhibition into a proposal. Um, so that was kind of, you know, a year ahead at this point in time. But we both um, extremely interested in kind of sculpture, processes, materials. And in a kind of parallel with the, the work with the donors, we were also trying to develop um, the sculptural element um, of the work, um, which would form the proposal. So um, we went to Orkney and um, we were both very interested in looking at kind of Neolithic burial traditions and um, you know there's most of the 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 art many of the artifacts that were found um, were of course made of clay so we were looking at sort of natural seams of clay this is just beside um, an amazing Neolithic settlement in Orkney called Scarabray um, 
There was also a funny moment happened where in order to think of developing the piece as a, an artwork to be shown in a, a, an art space, we had to almost re-anonymise the donors after that whole process of getting to know them really well. For a long time we had no idea of what we could possibly do because all we could think of were, were them and oh, they don't really like, no we can't do that because they they don't like water. They don't. So there was a bit of a, a kind of moment where we said, we're not going to see you for a while so that we can try to retain, um, regain some sort of moment of, of objectivity, I guess. Um, so this was maybe part of that time. Um, we were going to other um, sort of cultural contexts as well to, to see how body donation worked there. Um, this is ra rather amazing sort of jar coffin research in South Korea, but another time. <laughs> Um, so in Orkney, we um, looking at the the kind of archaeological um, sort of artifacts in museums. We met a potter who had become, through his interest in archaeology and the finds, and working with archaeologists. He was a an amateur archaeologist, I guess, but he had become. Um, he made his pots during the day in his pottery, um, but he also did kind of experimental archaeology work um, for the digs. So he'd be trying to recreate um, from shards and um, traces of pottery that were found. He'd be trying to figure out how they were made. Um, and that is very difficult because Orkney clay is, is absolutely disgusting, stony stuff. So he was coming up with some absolutely amazing, groundbreaking sort of new research about how they actually worked with the clay to make the rather um, sort of intricate sort of pots and forms that were being found in the digs. So th we decided our material starting point would be Orkney clay and about a six month process of um, using clay shipped from Orkney um, that Andrew the potter um, sort of dug out for us. Um, we decided to make the project just with as much as he could get for us at one period, of, at this period in time. Um, we started, um, the, the starting point is to lay it out to dry and then a long process of removing stones, breaking it down, rehydrating it. We weren't pedantically um, adhering to Neolithic methods, um, but it was completely low-tech. We weren't going to use any, any machines. So I'm showing you the process. At the same time, we're evolving ideas of what the sculptural form would be, um, what to make from the clay and, and why. I've already said that we decided to make the exhibition um, as a proposal. Um, on the one hand, it would look like a rather conventional sculpture exhibition, but on the other, it would be this specific proposal for the two donors that would explain specifically and explicit to them what our artistic research um, was proposing, what the aesthetic repurposing of their physical remains would actually be. Um, so towards designing the structure for the proposal um, that would be made of clay, um, our research took us to this lovely little building. Um, Brody and I made a project together in the Edinburgh Festival um, a couple of years back and we actually made it in a in an 18th century watchtower in a graveyard. So we were kind of aware um, of these structures that were built all over Scotland um, prior to the Anatomy Act of 1834, when, um, I mean, Burke and Hare being the most infamous ones, um, there was a, a, a moment where the medical and anatomy schools in Scotland were burgeoning. There wasn't any um, material um, for the students to practice on. So um, grave robbing was employed to supply these new um, anatomy schools. So lots and lots of interesting structures exist in Scottish graveyards um, that were built to try to foil the grave robbers. Um, mort safes and like structures sort of built over graveyards. Um, but this was a particularly amazing one in a very tiny village um, in Udney in Aberdeenshire, Scotland. Um, Aberdeen was one of the biggest medical schools. Um, it's made of solid granite, um, more than a foot thick. It's in a strong circular form. Um, it's got a solid reinforced oak um, roof and a steel door. 
So the bodies would be stored inside this structure until they had rotted um, to such an extent that they could be buried when they were no, of no longer of any interest to anatomists because they were they were too sort of rotten. So it was never used like many of the structures. Um, an anatomy act, a new anatomy act, was introduced in 1834. I've got that right, Martha. Um, where um, unclaimed bodies, mostly from hospitals and workhouses, could then be taken for use in the anatomy and medical schools. So that stopped the need for grave robbing. Um, so a lot of these structures were built and never used. Um, the community must have raised a phenomenal amount of money to, to make this. Um, inside the structure, it was like a huge lazy Susan that turned. Um, so you could lay you know, multiple bodies on it at different um, states of decomposition and access them from this steel door. So this is the lovely graveyard caretaker who's been there for 50 years, um, showing us the building. So we took this... Um, building as the template for the sculpture that we were going to make this place that was the resting place of these bodies to keep them safe. Um, we measured the, the circle and designed our sculpture to have the same dimensions as this building. Um, in terms of the, the proposal itself, um, this wasn't explicit, as I say, to the to the viewers of the exhibition, but you know, I'm telling you a little bit in retrospect. So we had to go back to the anatomy lab <clears throat> and what we had experienced in that quite long time that we had spent looking at the bodies in a way that I hadn't really done up until then. We had got um over our kind of angst very quickly and started looking at the material of the body um, and these interesting marks that appeared um, on the skin we talked to the anatomist about it and um, it was a process that in some other works of mine where I've used um, kind of more forensic procedures um, I, I already knew about hypostasis which happens when fluid gathers at the lowest um, sort of place and if the body at a particular time is laid on a surface and um, whatever it's laid on is indelibly imprinted you know on the body itself that happens for a particular window after death and I think it actually happens um, there's another possibility for that to happen during embalming when the the body gets all puffed up with fluid again so we considered um, that we would propose um, a, a kind of series of small, subtle sculptural gestures and a series of indelible marks um, that would be transferred onto the body um, after death and that would be our proposal. The bodies would then um, go through their journey in the anatomy labs um, and be dissected um, as normal. Um, of course, nobody who was doing any of the dissection cared about these body, um, these um, marks. They were just sort of things that happened as part of the process. But as artists, they were things that we particularly um, were drawn to. Um, so that's what our proposal was going to be. But um, we decided to make the, um, the clay forms as the things which would transfer these marks onto the body. So we made the um, we made the made and fired the clay as I say in a kind of low tech Neolithic way. Um, I'll show you a little tiny film clip of um, the firing and the making of the clay. I think I'll say that and not Remco, the curator. <coughs> okay. Nearly finished, sorry it's taking so long. Okay, so that was a, a clay walled, um, sorry, a, a turf walled kiln that we built at Cove Park, an artist residency centre really near where, where I live. It had to be built in the same dimensions as the sculpture and therefore as the mort house so that we could um, make these, um, fire the, the pieces in order. Otherwise, we would, we would never be able to put them back together again. 
So you saw a little clip actually from the exhibition itself there. So the sculptural work was installed in CCA. Um, as I say, the notion, our, our idea for our proposal to the donors was that sections of this clay sculpture would be taken to a place where after death they would lie or their bodies would be laying on the sculpture and it would make these hypostatic uh, marks. That would be a private performance. Um, there was never any idea of showing any sort of public sort of manifestation of this process. It would be undertaken um, mostly by mortuary technicians, I imagine, as a performative act according to our instructions. So the public manifestation is this proposal exhibition and, of course, me talking about it to you. Um, it was important as well that we had a prototype to the clay circle. Um, so that was... Um, a, a circle that was made in the same dimensions, but it was made of laser-sintered ceramics, a very first 21st century kind of hand, hands-off process. Um, the circle and the, the sections were given over and designed largely by um, a team of engineers in, in a company who, who made this. Um, our instructions were that it had to bear the weight of, of the body, so they structurally optimised each piece in order to do this. You maybe know, but laser sintering uses a kind of glass powder. Um, a laser's fired um, and the glass fuses together um, to make these high-tech ceramic forms. So throughout the period of the exhibition, um, we had a performer who would come and lie down um, on these kind of prototype shapes as a kind of investigation, not very rigorous, just a more of a gestural sort of notion of how to transfer these marks onto the skin. And then we made a video work um, from that that was um, exhibited in the exhibition. So it was a, a, a video where the marks slowly faded, um, which of course they wouldn't do um, in the final case. Um, there was a newspaper um, which accompanied the, the exhibition. Um, at the very start. So you were in no doubt that this exhibition is a proposal for two body donors, but it wasn't it was a lot of background material but not an enormous amount of, of kind of explanation. It wasn't didactic. The material that was in there was very open ended. Um, the first visitors to the exhibition were the donors. We took them round and talked to them about it in person. And um, the last people to see the exhibition was, were also the donors. It ended with a kind of public talk, a debate which the two donors were at. And interestingly, there was a very dramatic moment where one of the donors decided to out herself as a donor and ask if anyone wanted to ask her questions about the process, which was really rather amazing. Um, and there's the headline in the local paper. Um, spent hours talking to the journalist and we got to look at his piece and it was really rather thoughtful. But what we didn't know or, well, naively forgot about was that the editor would have the final say. He slapped on the headline so that people would read it. When she started reading it, you it was like the most kind of boring process-based art project that lasted four years. We obviously weren't Damien Hurst, but um, the headline maybe got sold a few more newspapers, I don't know. So where we're at now, this is my last slide. This is um, There's lots more images of past work on my, my page there, my Baltic professor page, if you want to look me up. I think... The, the, the stage we're at now is that one of the donors, the one who outed herself, said she absolutely wanted to accept the proposal and go ahead with it. The other said, you know, we, we said, well, what we need now is another period where, you know, all these ethics pr procedures, legal questions, um, we have to take them on. Um, now, we, now we feel we actually want to and we're in a position to, so we need another period of research. So one donor said, you know, I'd like to do it no matter what. The other said, I'll stay with you on the journey. So hopefully we're about to um, go into 
go into another phase of research towards any possibility of making it a, a reality um, in legal, ethical, procedural terms. Part of that is building new relationships with institutions, including an art institution that will have to look after and hopefully display this work. And then it will have to col the art institution that decided to house this would have to collaborate with any medical institutions who were caring for dead bodies. And of course, not least of all, is the problem that the artists ourselves could well die before the donors. Okay, thank you. It's really exciting to be in Gothenburg, and I've been here several times before. In fact, I've been in this very room uh, some years ago, uh, and I think it's a really lovely town, and that you have. Uh, uh, in, especially in, in Nordic countries, a really innovative uh, approach to uh, collaborations and to uh, ways in which museums uh, can function and can um, create uh, arenas for different kinds of knowledge and different kinds of triangulations, like I was mentioning earlier in response to someone's uh, questions about how researchers work together. I have um, quite a lot of experience, particularly in scientific uh, museums, and I uh, was invited by Matty Pai uh, several years ago when she ran the Artists' Work in the Museum project uh, to make a presentation at the conference that she uh, organized with Linda Sandino, and in fact, in the proceedings volume, um, I am the only artist who has worked in science museums who, uh, whose work is represented in that, uh, that volume. I think it is a very particular arena, and uh, I think it's a really exciting pro prospect that the Medical Museum uh, joins up with Valand. So I'd like to thank you both, in fact, for inviting me here today, um, both uh, Valand and the Medical Historical Museum. Um, I'm going to address uh, two key themes today that I believe are actually very important for students and also for museum staff in making a collaborative exhibition project next year with the Medical History Museum. Uh, I will start by giving you uh, some outline of some of the projects that I've done as an artist, as a curator, as a bureaucrat, as an educator, um, and... I'm also going to give a short account of uh, issues in medical humanities as they relate to the material culture of medicine. And in that, uh, in that regard, the main message is that there are many important and critical issues in medicine that go far beyond the body and the history of the body. Uh, my second aim here is to give some pragmatic advice to prepare artists from Valand Academy for working in museum contexts. And this uh, pragmatic advice will be given from my own experience. Uh, the main message on that note is that museums are highly complex institutions to navigate. And we've circled around this issue of the practicalities uh, of these collaborations and the alignment, and sometimes lack of alignment, uh, between the different uh, uh, procedures that are involved in making uh, artworks and in uh, functioning museums' own practice. So uh, I think I'd, that's an important thing for us to be talking about, pragmatics. But first, uh, I'm going to uh, give you a bit of background in something of my own work, um, because I have actually been working in this funny zone between art, science, and museums, uh, actually for 30 years. Um, the first major project that I produced in that particular area of institutional critique was a large-scale site-specific installation entitled Le Musée des Sciences. And here we have a museum facade that actually was not a museum, it's a post office. Um, so this, this project opened in 1984, and it was a collaboration with my then partner, the artist Lynn Lapointe. Uh, it took place in Montreal, Canada, in an abandoned Beaux-Arts-style post office that had a facade that directly related to the fine art museum that was up the hill. 
It was a materialization of a history of the body really before that field of research existed. So to give you a sense of the intellectual period in 1984 when this project opened, it was the same year that Michel Foucault's two final volumes of the history of sexuality were published for the first time in French. Foucault's uses of pleasure and the care of the self were actually both published during 1984. In January of that same year, Le Musée des Sciences opened to the public. Another temporal frame of reference for the period would be that in 1984, uh, that's also the year in which uh, Julie Alt, the late Felix Gonzalez Torres and others as part of group material, produced their first timeline project, a chronicle of U.S. intervention in Central and Latin America at PS1. Felix was, during his lifetime, a friend, and Julie still is. So what kinds of body history did we do 30 years ago with Le Musée des Sciences? And I will give you uh, one example from this project and one example from another project before I move on to my main points. So in Le Musée des Sciences, the major installation in the uh, downstairs area was actually a large-scale anamorphosis. It's a visual history of two bodies, not just one. This large-scale anamorphic painting was created on the vast sorting room floor of the old post office that became briefly our Musée des Sciences. Our anamorphosis here, thank you, was, a type, was of the type corrected by a central cylindrical mirror. With the mirror in the middle, we see that meaning is actually inherent in the apparatus itself, not only in the image or in our own unconscious. The vastness of the floor itself refused an obligation to a unique point of view and to a unique point of departure in a spatial narrative. People moved around on the painting itself, and in relation to the image in the mirror. And for each, according to their height, there was a unique point at which the painting on the floor came into focus in the mirror. The mirror cylinder was built around an existing column, and the floor drawing was actually of two women. One, a black African hottentot, replete with hypertrophy of the labia, as observed by Le Vaillant in 1803, and the other, a white European from an anatomical textbook by Charles Estienne, which was dated 1545. The first was from an anthropological text, and the second, a plate from uh, an anatomical treatise. This isomorphism, or bringing together of two representations, created 250 years apart of women from two different continents, caught in two different domains of inquiry, makes it possible to focus back beyond and before the reflecting plane of the cylindrical mirror to see the ideological point of view which is shared by Estienne and Le Vaillant. As one walked over the swollen image of the women on the floor and approached the mirror, in the reflection the women began to attain normal proportions, becoming perfectly ordered, in the smooth, reflective surface of its phallic structure. But when the women were in perspective, the spectators, in the same curved reflection, were out of shape. So we've got bodies to look at, but we've also got bodies looking, an audience. It's through the physiology of vision and motion that sense is made of the images and of the installation itself. The project took place in an abandoned public service building in which the body politic is literally formed through service. What you've just seen is one of several in a range of institutions that took place across all three floors of the building. Later, in 1999, I went from museum parody to museum practice and made my first major collection interpretation project at the Science Museum in London. I, who had studied museum structure in order to parody its conventions and question its knowledge claims in the previous project, now came up against the functional and logistical reality of working inside one. 
And I have to say that it's only through the generosity of the museum professionals, the curators, exhibition designers, conservation technicians, and more, that I was able to learn enough, and quickly enough, to produce an exhibition that included 130 objects in 16 discrete installations embedded right across the museum. This project took two years to make, and it was self-created. I presented it as a, as a possibility to the museum, and it was accepted uh, on the grounds that it would be under the wing of the, uh, of the head of collections, basically. So it was an experiment for them. Um, and I know that residencies now are much shorter and there, is, there can be problems with the, the, the length of time that one has inside a collection, as Sarah has uh, uh, mentioned. But imagine that a woman who has no scientific training and no museological degree wants to take objects from the mathematics collection and pair them up with objects from the therapeutics collection and then place them in the computing gallery, for example. Imagine that one modest pairing of objects requires the consent of no less than three curators before you even see the technicians in the conservation department, the workshop that will organize the actual displays, and the design studio about labeling. This was the encounter that I had with the Science Museum staff, and on both sides, lessons were learnt. So now we come to our second pair of bodies, and these ones are made of glass. If we wanted to be art historical, we could remark on the similarities and differences between the outlines of the bodies of the two women we've just been looking at in the mirror, with their dark voids demarcated by white lines, and the luminous transparency of these two bottles in the foreground, which I think you can barely see, in fact. Are they visible? Okay. Yeah, that might be an idea. So these, these in fact, are the two objects. Um, okay. Okay. So these are the objects in, in situ in the, in the computing gallery. <coughs> So these two glass bodies also contain something, and their glass walls, though transparent, are a border or a membrane. These limits have punctums, and they invite exploration, rather like our own bodies do. One of them is a Klein bottle, a closed single-surface vessel, which is like a 3D Mobius strip. It's a model of a topological mathematical equation, and technically it has no inside or outside. The other bottle is for the keeping of leeches in salt brine. Leeches were used by doctors to draw blood from patients until about 1830. The text label for this pairing of objects reads as follows. Both of these bodies are penetrable to light and anything else that we might want to have enter them, as the foxglove's flower awaits your baby finger. We see that in spite of their differences, both these bottles begin and end at any place along their sensitive surfaces, a place which is both inside and outside at the same time. This is their miracle, and it is more than mathematical. Or is it mathematics that is more than what we think it is? It's an aesthetic analysis that's based on materials and not on disciplines. It's phenomenological and it proposes a hypothesis. However, it was not until I worked on a project in a dedicated medical museum that I really understood, paradoxically, how much of medicine goes far beyond the body. In 2006, I began a visiting professorship at the University of Copenhagen with the Medicinsk Museion. I worked there as the creative director of an exhibition about my biomedicine that was called Split and Splice, Fragments from the Age of Biomedicine. And it was a collaboration with four brilliant postdoctoral historians of contemporary medicine. 
I learned from them that medicine today is not so much about direct intervention in the body as it is about the ways in which bodies are themselves inscribed into a range of scientific practices that are all deeply inflected socially and culturally by their time and place. They drew my attention to the fact that there is legislation exchanged, researched, cryopreserved, displayed, and more. And uh, anyone who has actually worked in these collections, or, uh, such as Christine or Sarah, uh, and indeed uh, the project that Mary ran, uh, will know about how heavily uh, circumscribed um, uh, body, body parts and uh, body elements are. Um, these laws are actually as interesting to artists as the body parts themselves. That's the point that I'm trying to make here. So these bodies and parts of bodies are actually in some way co-created, but not by surgical tools. They are co-created by legislation. They are incomprehensible, the body parts, without the legislation that has created them. Of course, I knew this from Foucault, but the precise extension of his ideas into the 21st century is a complex project. One of the most important bridges from Foucault to us, for better or worse, is the work of Bruno Latour, the sociologist of science who developed what is known as actor network theory. For Latour, the production of all scientific knowledge, whether of medicine or not, is composed of four different kinds of processes. Inscription, such as the legislation processes that I've just mentioned. Translation, which is the aligning of goals, methods, and practices. Uh, 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 sorry, standardization, which uh, can actually be anything from uh, the, the sorts of laws that we've just been speaking about and the sorts of bodies that, they're created to, that are created within them, uh, or uh, pharmaceutical dosages, for example, um, literally medical standards, uh, which are internationally regulated, uh, and then translation, which I've just mentioned, which is the aligning of goals or methods and practices. And ultimately, the fourth, uh, the fourth action that Latour defines as part of actor network theory is actually accumulation of evidence, for example, uh, but also perhaps for us today, something more akin to museum collections. So yes, my colleagues in the, as the historians of medicine showed me that standardization and so on are highly significant practices in medicine. These standards create an impossibly idealized body that is easier for medicine to handle and process effectively and from which to harvest or inscribe evidential data. For example, this ECG machine. The kinds of machines that harvest data from bodies are themselves highly standardized and the hidden processes that they undertake are a significant one to critique. How can you do this with medical museum collections? For example, medical and physiological data can be generated by an extensive battery of measuring machines of greater and greater complexity. And then the data that is harvested can actually be brought together and conjoined in large databases, for example, such as an epidemiological data set, which might be kept by the state, the same state that also keeps your personal identification number, the same state that also keeps your tax information. I wanted to show you this image in particular that, that uh, actually used the building of the uh, medical museum uh, and the way in which uh, materials, water, air, and so on, flow through the building. Because up here, directly above where, <laughs> where you see the, the slide, there are similar uh, flow diagrams on the vents 
directly above the, the uh, slide projector. So we were trying to show the way in which, even, even in the actual structures of the building, uh, these kinds of flows of data and uh, the sort of capital that's involved in pharmaceutics, for example, um, are embedded in the very structures that you might be standing in. On this project, I also discovered just how small bodies can be. Scale is one of the most basic tools that artists can use to make things strange. A practice or an object becomes contextually reconsidered when we change its scale. For medicine, the molecular scale is the main scale at which most real research happens now. How can we as artists critique the implications of this scalar research with what we know? Each and every one of these tiny gene chips contains the entire DNA profile of, in this case, a mouse. This standardized fragmentation and fixing of segments of DNA is structured into a grid array that can then be scanned and turned into data, which can in turn be manipulated. And the mouse DNA reminds us that human bodies are not the only bodies that are caught up in contemporary medical practices. Other animals are deeply entwined in these practices, either as standing in as models for humans, in the case of the mice, or perhaps as vectors for disease, in the case of mosquitoes. There are even animals that are bred specifically so that their internal organs are the same size and scale as human organs, such as the Göttingen mini pig. You are not likely to find a Göttingen mini pig in the collections of the Medical History Museum here in Gothenburg, but you may find instruments and lab materials and working notebooks that relate to the deep connections between human bodies and animal bodies. Exploring zoonosis, the way in which illnesses such as Ebola, rabies, or malaria, for example, transfer from animals to humans, uh, or, for example, the study of what is now called One Health, the complex ecologies of health across human, animal, and environmental arenas, can actually also be a very fruitful study in medical museum collections. Another complexity of medical practice that you will find evidenced in the medical museum collections is that of the regulation of temperatures. From the deep heat of medical um, of, of incubators, for example, which are often used in laboratories as well as in fertility, we go to the sub-zero environments of cryo-freezing, what is being manipulated with these instruments is more than just hot and cold. Temporalities are also infinitely bound up in these temperatures, as is the pace of life, which is speeded up or slowed down according to the temperature in which the life finds itself. Attending to the complex effects and affects of instruments is part of what a serious inquiry by artists into the holdings of a medical museum might uh, involve. It will also be a highly collaborative process, as many have discussed today, not just with other artists, but also with museum curators, conservators, registrars, and others. It will be a collaboration with medical humanities thinkers, either via their publications or via direct consultation with them, something that I highly recommend. And this is where we come to the second part of my talk that I mentioned, some advice to prepare a good working practice with a museum and its collections. A museum is a complex apparatus, and each one is unique. But there are some shared realities that it's crucial for you as artists to understand if you are to use this apparatus with any success. You will need help to navigate the collections themselves. That help comes from co-researchers 
who already work in the museum, who are museum professionals, and who are research active themselves. It comes from catalogs that may be naturally incomplete, because the collection is constantly growing. It comes from storerooms that may not all be as well organized as you expect, for the same reason. You will be navigating an environment of extraordinary complexity. There will be a range of catalogs designed with, in some cases, elaborate uh, database architectures and other information science practices that connect knowledge to objects. These catalogs do not all contain the same information. And I think uh, it's worth talking about this because it was something uh, that was brought up um, earlier uh, in relation to uh, the, the online searches that, that were being, uh, that you were affecting, Lauren. Um, it's very important to know that there are many layers of catalogs that uh, not everything has been digitized, not everything has been data mapped online, not every museum has uh, a computerized database, uh, and there are also going to be uh, catalogs that are uh, pre-catalogs that have been either handwritten, that are in curators' offices, or that are in Excel spreadsheets. Uh, these, are, these are highly intertextual, hypertextual bodies of knowledge that connect objects you are interested in, not just to their location, but also to acquisition files, to other collections and references, and your, uh, your collection colleagues who are your co-researchers in what you're going to be doing know how to navigate those things in a way that goes far, far beyond the, the sort of um, search tools that uh, in a digital age we're used to using. So these are knowledge practices that are literally hundreds of years old and that, uh, that need uh, patience and they also need, um, they need you to really collaborate closely uh, and support the work of the museum professionals who know how to navigate these systems. So in short, you're dealing not just with objects but with people other researchers, other artists, and museum professionals. You will de be dealing with storerooms that, rather like this one, uh, are not particularly well uh, organized because the museum may be under-resourced in certain areas. That doesn't mean that, that it's any different from any other museum, even major national museums in other countries have uh, storage problems. So um, you're also going to be dealing with documentation files, which is the, the, all the information that comes into the museum alongside the objects themselves. And these collateral bodies of knowledge and bits of information are extremely valuable for the kind of work that you do as artists that involves contextual, contextualizing the material that you're looking at and building an, uh, an interstices between the object, the knowledge that is, uh, that is held about it, and, the, and the, the building in which it is, or in which you the way in which you choose to exhibit it, um, or alter it in some way. You're also going to be dealing with objects, some of which are too big or too small. You're going to be dealing with objects that are broken or lost, or that have difficult histories that might be more complex to un unveil than you think. You're going to be dealing with copyright and with data protection issues, particularly in uh, medical museums. And I think several people have addressed this. The fact that you're going to be dealing with these ethical considerations that present for all museums are specifically um, heightened when we're, when we're dealing with uh, uh, medical museums that have even uh, tighter uh, circumscriptions. So working with museums is an encounter. It's an encounter with material culture in all its organic complexity, things that rot, things that resist your interpretation, things that don't quite mean what you think they mean. It's an encounter with phenomena, with affect, with context, with politics. 
It's an encounter with an elaborate bureaucratical process that is designed to preserve collections and with which you must have patience. It's a knowledge experience connecting thoughts with things and texts. And above all, it's a personal and social encounter, not only with self, but with others, some of whom are museum staff, and they are your most precious collaborators. So, the museum, a highly codified arena, governed by conventions and norms, the objects within which are studied and brought into contact with each other, in order to understand their historical or origins and interactions outside that closed system of the museum. This is essentially a description of a laboratory. What kind of arena for epistemological, aesthetic, political and radical thinking can a museum laboratory actually be? In the realm of museum display, the history of medicine arguably has an advantage over other histories of, the, of other sciences. This advantage is also among the most difficult to deploy, the most volatile, and the most easily misused by exhibition makers. It is the advantage that is offered by the wide-ranging personal experiences of medicine that each visitor brings to the museum with them, and the myriad ways in which those visitors' identities are a priori entwined and fused with their experience of their bodies and their bodies' health. No other science has content that is also held so deeply inside each and every museum visitor's conscious substance and psyche. Like a built-in counterweight, this advantage of the subject matter of medical history exhibitions ties the visitor's fascination with the ex exhibition to their sense of self. It's a tethering that, if mishandled, can just as easily backfire, catapulting the visitor into a state of fear and abjection and casting the exhibition and its museum into a no-go zone. Sensationalist misuse of instruments, such as surgical saws, needles and laparoscopes or specula, all of which enter the body, or of full-body MRI scanners or X-ray rooms or covered stretchers or these kinds of uh, negative pressure ventilators, which actually enclose the body, are among the prime examples of medical exhibition shock tactics that can badly rebound. One way to avoid this rebound is to look at the very relationship between medical subject matter and personal visitor experience as part of the exhibition itself, a philosophy lesson from the inside out. Many of the tools with which we have uh, been able to affect this were first given to us by Foucault from that book-lined room that we saw early in my talk. Conversely, it's not surprising that one of the greatest historians of modernity would look first to medicine, psychiatry, the body, and sexuality, because this nexus contains so very much of what it is important to reflect upon. In working with the collections of a medical museum, we can have helpful recourse to one of the many amazing tools that Foucault created for us to work with. In particular, his theory of technologies of the self was generated from within the particular frame of his research that could be described as history of medicine writ large. Proposed as one of four interlocking systems, technology of the self engages variously with the other three technologies that Foucault identified, technologies of production, of sign systems, and of power. Technologies of the self permit individuals to effect, by their own means or with the help of others, a certain number of operations on their own bodies and souls, their thoughts, conduct, and way of being, so as to transform themselves in order to attain a certain state of happiness, purity, wisdom, perfection, or immortality. This, of course, never happens in isolation. 
when coming into contact with technologies of power, technologies of the self originating with the intent to improve one's lot can become enmeshed in other acts and actions that can, in fact, be highly compromising to the realization of self. Yet these compromising governmental acts can present themselves as the only way to realize a self, often so invisibly as to appear to be the best way to realize a self. Within medicine, many social and scientific changes converge in the human body itself, and therefore they are difficult to observe with any distance or objectivity. If we choose to examine in an exhibition, in an art project, the very contact between the individual and the biomedical apparatus in its complex complexity, the contact that takes place sometimes even at a distance, unwittingly, and at times without informed choice or consent, we could create an exhibition that could unpick this diffuse and decentralized contact. I suppose we would have before us technologies of production, instruments of analysis and computation, for example, that I mentioned. We would have technologies of power, for example, the regimes of authority and knowledge that are bounded up in medical practice. We would also have the technologies of sign systems, such as medical vocabularies and indexical relations. We would also have technologies of the self in which the individual attempts to care for the self, in part by engaging with all these other technologies. To think beyond the body when you are working in a medical museum collection is perhaps the most important intellectual and creative challenge you will experience as an artist. And of course, an artist will never forget that even an exhibition is a technology too. Thank you. Reassemble for uh, the final um, presentation before we open for a little while and broader sort of questions, including specifically from this panel. Um, I'm delighted that the final presentation is uh, by Lisa Spinn uh, Smith, um, who is the director of the Medical History Museum here in Gothenburg, which is um, in association with uh, a teaching hospital. So it sits in a very specific sort of context and we're also really delighted that um, for this specific project that we will work on in spring that actually Lisa approached us and not the other way around which um, kind of puts a very interesting dynamic on the potentiality of the collaboration because it's an invitation to an art school biomedical history museum as opposed to an art school hunting for a context to produce something in so it, it sits very clear that there's a situation for discourse around this question of the invitation, but um, so Lisa. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, so I have the quite ungrateful um, uh, thing here to do the last presentation of today. Uh, and I and Mary, you have promised me to if I have get the mic under my nose. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm director and also curator at the Medical History. Um, Museum of uh, Göteborg, and I also had written it was 2016, but it's, uh, yeah, so we're not living in the past at the museum. Uh, so um, uh, this is a, sm it's a small museum in the city center, quite close to here. Um, the museum uh, is situated in a historical building, not built to be a museum, uh, and it was donated to and acted as Sargenska Hospital in the early 1800s. Uh, after that it gave room to a newspaper's office and for several years it was also a police headquarters. So the cells are actually now the museum depots. And quite a lot of uh, famous Swedish criminals has been uh, in the cells for not volunt voluntary? No. The collecting started in the 1930s in the attic of Sargenska Hospital. Most of the objects in the collections are from the early 1800s to the middle of 1900s. We have our collection care manager, Thomas, here, so I'm, yeah. Um, the permanent exhibition is mainly from 1986. 
The museum is organizationally a part of the Sargenska University Hospital, as uh, Jason said, and it has bo it's both its uh, pros and cons to have this kind of organization. I am fri quite free as director to, to do projects like this one, in this collaboration, but also we are quite isolated also as, an, as a museum. Uh, we have quite a modest budget, if I may say so. We are six people in the staff, and we see ourselves as a cultural historic museum more than a science museum. Unlike many other medical history museums, we do not have any wet specimen uh, except the leech in room B. The museum's collections are made up of fragments, remnants of a bygone era. Everything is volatilized. That is the way it is for all of us during a normal day at work, at school, at home, or on the bus. What will remain and what it will mean for the future generations, we do not know. Will it be a frying pan, a telephone, an office chair, or perhaps a bu bus ticket? Objects in the museum storerooms that we handle wearing white cotton gloves or those you see in the display cabinet were there. They existed before we did. If we are lucky, we can, through our exhibitions, induce a distinct sense of proximity, a sense of contact with history. In our current exhibition, Utebilden in Rummet, out of the picture into the room, I have made an attempt uh, through combining photographs and objects from our collections to create a feeling that history is emerging from the picture and entering into the room. As a long-time museum professional and having some of the time worked very close to the collections, I have experienced several encounters with this distinct sense of proximity. I think that to mediate this has been the main goal for me when inviting and welcoming an artist to collaborate with the museum. To try to show with as many means as possible to make openings and links to this proximity. The first example I would like to mention uh, is when we in, in spring 2010 were contacted by the artists Maria Boy and Maria Lostarin and they were planning an exhibition at the gallery at Konstepidemien. Konstepidemien has gotten its name from being situated in an old epidemic hospital. For their exhibition, May I Cry Now, they wanted to borrow objects from our collection that could in some way work as a reminder or a trace from the time of the hospital. In the old epidemic hospital, the objects in some way came to life again, and in close interaction with the artists' works became an installation. This was a new way of working for us, and I could see how the objects from our depot could stand out for themselves, as themselves, as a testimony of time that has passed. How they, in a new contest, context in an art gallery, were perceived as something else than they were as exhibits in our museum. <clears throat> the contents in at least our museum storerooms are a combination of chance and systematic acquisition. Some objects are there without explanation, without a context, and could easily become anonymous and forgotten. In 2012, inspired by a project made at the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, uh, I invited nine artists, scholars and writers to, uh, to a project I named Thing It Is Say, Thing In Itself. Uh, the main idea uh, ideas with this project was on the one hand to put focus on the collections and show that even the most boring looking thing could harbor or inspire to new stories or new expressions. 
On the other hand, I wanted to show the variety of contexts and interpretations I expected from the invited participants in the, in the project. So it's a mix of uh, artists, scholars and, uh, and writers. Uh, they were invited to come into our depot with me and choose one object each to relate to within the frames of an anthology. So, yeah. To make a book, something that would last longer than an exhibition felt important. Uh, working with exhibitions, uh, you, you may spend a lot of many years with this and then it's uh, just for a short period someone can see it and then it's gone. So, uh, yeah, so this feels good. Uh, when the book was released, we opened an exhibition uh, displaying the objects uh, that had been chosen. We aimed to focus on the objects, making it possible for the visitor to just stand and observe in awe and wonder. The label was only naming the object and presenting what materials it was made of. If the visitors wanted to know more, they could turn to the book and choose to read the museum's more thorough description or the participants' interpretations. The objects that were chosen are both everyday objects and rare parts of the collection. Some of them are very specific technical objects and some more human, worn and torn by long use. During the collaboration with the project's participants, I realized that many already had a topic or even an object chosen before their first visit to the depot. Others kept it totally open until they had seen the collections and some changed their minds after the visit. I think it had to do with, for example, presumptuous ideas of what a medical museum could hold in its um, collections or perhaps whether they were object or text oriented. This empty, this empty pocket calendar from 1970 was chosen by the artist Peter Ecker. His text came to deal with the phenomenon of spying on other people. Peter associated the quest for information about the pocket calendar with him being able to see or spy on his unborn child on the printed picture from the ultrasound machine. And also with the artist Sophie Kahl's projects, where she spies on people and documents it. And this is of course what we do when we look through the archives, many times through papers and photos that are very private and never was meant to end up in a museum. In Klaus Karlström's case, it's the name written on the calendar, uh, when Peter found the calendar, I remembered that we have a photo album that once belonged to a person with the same name. And it turned out to be, it was the same person. In his chapter, Peter picked out some of the eerie, fading photographs from the album, which was made by Karlström, commemorating his time in Persia as a young doctor as a part of the Swedish gendarmerie in the beginning of the last century. In Peter's research, the mystery of the empty pocket calendar from 1970 was finally cleared up in the end when he found out that Klaus, Klaus Karlström died that year, so he never used the calendar. Maria Låstern, Låstarinen, who I also invited to this project, uh, chose this photometer used in an eye clinic in the late, 19, uh, late, late 1800s and uh, created a poem. You can see it. Ah. You can also look at the book afterwards if you want to. Uh, she created a poem, Holes, and uh, an aquarelle, which included her impressions of our walk through the depot. And the photometer has kept on living in her imagery, uh, uh, in Maria Låstarinen's art. In her solo exhibition Les Eures qu'elle protège at the local retten uh, in Stockholm, uh, the photometer was resurrected in a new body at the beginning of this year. 
On the last day of her exhibition, I came there and I held a speech about our collaboration. So I think that's nice. At the museum, we reconstruct environments and we attempt to recreate locations and events as they once were. How do you recreate what you cannot mediate through objects, words and pictures? Last spring I was contacted by the artists Anna Bergström and Richard Widerberg. They wondered if I could help them with contacts inside the Sargenska hospital and suggestions on who to contact concerning a site-specific performance piece that they wanted to perform at the hospital. It is quite hard to get access to hospital environments for these kinds of projects and it turned out to be impossible at the moment. When I first heard about their idea, I suggested as an alternative that they could do it at the museum. And during the summer, we started planning for a performance at the museum instead. They got to know our museum and exhibitions and got access to the archive. Our collaboration resulted in an interactive installation based uh, installation based performance called förkroppsligande av det outtalade or embodying the unspoken uh, it was perfor performed during four days two times a day in september 2004 14. the museum was open to the public and some visitors came especially for the performance uh, and uh, and then some regular visitors got an extra treat on their visit. During the preparation and rehearsal period, the museum's library became the artist's dressing room and prop room. The whole museum staff acted as a test audience uh, and we were brought through the exhibition rooms where different scenes had been built up. The interactive parts were sometimes not only pleasant, uh, which made us produce a thorough information at the reception uh, on what was going on at the museum that week. Anna Bergström and Rika Widerberg describes the piece as an investigation of what's human in the body of illness and the history of medical care. An embodiment of the unspoken exists in between the lines of historical medical descriptions and texts, as well as within the personal stories. In such a way, we meet memories and vibrations present, present in the spaces within the museum and its objects, as a museum, archive and hospital." End of quote. Fragments of old interviews with nurses became a part of the sound installations. Stories told about the objects in the displays came to life. Anna and Rickard's piece caught something I have never been close to capture or illustrate as a curator. Another collaboration with artworks in our exhibitions was a one-day exhibition curated by Maria Domelöv-Wik called Med kroppen som instrument, <coughs> Sorry. or a celebration of the body, in spring 2013. Quite shortly after we had opened the exhibition Tinget i Sey, I was contacted by Maria, then a student at the Master of Fine Arts and Film program at Valand Academy. She wondered if we were interested to give room for her graduate exhibition. We discussed the themes she wanted to address, such as images of the female body and societies in the medical history's attempt to reduce, tame and pathologize the female body. I found these themes very relevant in relation to our exhibitions and their contents, so we decided to collaborate. Monitors screening five films made by the artists Sara Ekström, Berit Basten, <coughs> Josephine Adams and Kai Sukoski, whose work for Lessons in Anatomy you see is still from here inside our um, operating room. They were placed inside the, the exhibitions. As a part of the exhibition, Maria also invited the choreographer and buto dancer, Frauke Caroline Lundblad, who performed a site-specific piece in the museum's courtyard. 
The event was a success and we still get feedback from people who were there. But it was also a big challenge for our small museum with all the preparations that were needed to be done when it came to technical, ethical and spatial matters. And also the terms connected to working with an outside curator, which was the first time for us. Perhaps we could have needed <coughs> more time to plan the event. And I would gladly have seen it displayed for a longer period than one day, which is extremely short in my world. Uh, this spring we commenced planning the collaboration with the Valand Academy, in which this seminar is uh, an important part. The Master One students, and uh, many of you are here. <laughs> nice to see you again. Uh, uh, have now been visiting the museum uh, and gotten an introduction to our collection and institution. Uh, I also have, uh, have felt that it was important to get to know the, the, the Valand Academies uh, uh, as an institution and how it's organized. And I come to a few conferences to try to get to know you and understand how your inner logics. Uh, <laughs> if it's possible, <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, so a museum is something completely different than an art gallery, which we also have talked a lot about today. And um, our museum is definitely not a white box. Um, so here you can see a map of the exhibitions where I have marked the recommended areas for the artworks. But um, I am expecting negotiations about this. Uh, <laughs> and I am really looking forward to working together during the following months and to see the exhibition Helt sjukt, Totally Sick, uh, being realized in April 2016. Thank you. So thanks for your presentation. It was incredible. And because it's also very relevant for something I'm working with Lisa, and which is specifically about what medical museums say about the state and how society is organized in a medical way. And the particular stand, the stay of Foucault in Sweden, that uh, was very peculiar. But during this research, I guess, I always get to these places uh, which are very aesthetic, I guess. And I found that that, that has some tension with the sort of demand of pedagog being pedagogic when you engage in a public exhibition. So um, I, wonder, I wanted to ask you like, how you kind of negotiate these kind of um, um, aesthetic interventions or like this artistic intervention with also this demand of being pedagogic that sometimes they are really clashing. For me, in, in this case, that I'm like... When you say pedagogical, do you mean uh, teaching people about uh, medicine or do you mean teaching people about the uh, state contexts for medicine? I guess teaching people, but also assuming people don't know anything and then you uh, have to yeah. be very clear to them yeah. and that kind of stuff that, I mean, sometimes for me drives me crazy to think that people don't know anything when they enter a museum, kind of. But it's just something new for mm. me that I'm trying to... Well, what, uh, first of all, with the, with the project that was called Split and Splice, uh, that was done uh, in a medical history museum, and with uh, me as a creative practitioner uh, and some exhibition designers, and these four postdoctoral uh, uh, history of contemporary medicine uh, colleagues, what we tried to do is actually to take the epistemological issues that they understood deeply as very well-trained historians of science and the uh, aesthetic knowledge that I have. And when I say aesthetic knowledge, I don't mean uh, knowledge of how to make things look good. I mean the fact that uh, there, are, there, is, uh, there are aesthetic um, knowledge based in what things look like is, and how to make things actually say what they mean 
by what they look like. That's what I mean by aesthetics. And the way in which people can draw that information out of uh, an object or a context by the, the actual appearance of what has been constructed, right? It's not just, it looks nice, it's that it says what it needs to say. Okay, so we took epistemology that they understood and this uh, highly um, structured way of understanding what it is that aesthetics, in even a sort of post-Kantian way, how can we conjoin these? That was the work that we did. So we literally spent two years of me teaching them these sorts of issues, the uh, aesthetic issues, and how to make something convey what you want it to convey. And they taught me about epistemology in relation to medical uh, uh, humanities issues. We spent two years conjoining that in about 35 different workshops that we ran intensively together. So uh, if you want to read about how we did that, uh, there is uh, an article that I wrote that's, uh, that's in a um, uh, publication that the Smithsonian Press published, uh, which is called Artifacts 9, and it's about art and aesthetics in science museums. So you can read about it uh, more deeply there, but if you want, I can send you the PDF as well. But, it, but it's hard work. You know, you, it's, it's not a, yeah. Um, I have a question for Christine. Um, I thought it was really interesting when you played the, the um, smelling clip there and you were embarrassed by it for some reason. I don't know why. But then um, also you were doing all these uh, different um, um, exercises, mm -hmm. it seemed. And, and, and you were talking about uh, gestalt therapy mm -hmm. and that it was your, your partner in this who yeah. was into that. And how I was interested in how that was important for the project and, and why you focus on that mm. part? So. Um, it was one of a number of, of kind of tests to move the, the project forward. And I guess there's a lot in there about the, the nature of, um, you know, collaboration and trying to make something that feels as if it belongs to both of you. So we're both drawing on the resources of developing an idea that we use in our own practices. And, um, you know, sometimes either of us would suggest a way forward, you know, based on something that we would just normally do and the other would recoil from it and there'd be a dialogue and we'd decide yes or no to go forward. And I suppose a little bit with the LARP, and with that, um, you know, when I started working with Brody, I would be saying to myself, there is no way I'm ever going to be. But, you know, before I knew it, um, you know, through discussion and dialogue, I decided that it was, it was something that it was out of my comfort zone. But that was part of the reason for applying for that grant and part of just part of how I felt about my practice at that point in time that... Um, you know, just a little bit fed up with myself and wanted to see what working with someone else would do. Um, so, you know, they were just all things, yes, they were exercises basically to to take us forward into territory that we, you know, apart from sort of reading around it, and of course we were, you know, meeting a whole other outer circle of people um, to give us advice and sort of talk to about the project other than our close collaborators. But it was about, you know, it was a collaborative project, finding a way to, to move forward. And like both the LARP and that, um, they're not shelved in a bad way, they're in the background as sort of, you know, it's it's research through practice. So you have to do stuff. Um, and sometimes, um, you know, that, that then becomes something in itself to go on towards the final work, and sometimes it isn't. So um, it's not all the time that you can have the luxury of that was, you know, a pot of money that got spent gradually over a four to five year period, and so could fund Brody coming, paying for donors to come, paying for, you know. So um, it is a luxurious position, but it felt like that was the, the time to go out of your comfort zone and to, you know, to, to embrace these sort of possibilities. Um, 